China loses a major legal case over territorial claims in the South China Sea. It's a victory for the Philippines, which filed the complaint. But will the ruling further inflame tensions in Southeast Asia? What kind of legal precedent does it set for other countries? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. It's one of the most disputed regions in the world, a stretch of ocean contested by the region's biggest power, China, as well as Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Taiwan and Vietnam. Now, for the first time, an international tribunal has ruled China has no legal basis to claim historic rights to resources in the South China Sea. Well, the Chinese government rejected the ruling before it was even released. Lots to discuss, but first, Adrian Brown and Jamila Alan Dogan set things up for us from Beijing and Manila. I don't think uh, China's government will be at all surprised by this ruling, which is why the Ministry of Foreign Affairs issued a statement within minutes of this ruling being published. It said that the ruling was in many ways ill-founded. And then China released a very detailed statement that explained why China's claims were based really on history. It said that Chinese fishermen had been going to the South China Sea since the 13th century. China named these islands. China discovered these islands. So in many ways, nothing has changed. But the question now is what will China do next? And is what it does next is what it does next going to raise or lessen tensions in the South China Sea? Will China, for instance, now resume its island building program? State media has reported in recent days that it might want to build up a place called Scarborough Shoal and put in a deep water harbour that could accommodate warships. Would it also, for instance, now establish what's been known as an air defence identification zone over the South China Sea, which would require aircraft to basically register with the Chinese authorities when they flew over the South China Sea. That, from the perspective of Washington, would be regarded as a very provocative action. Uh, I spoke to one expert a few days ago who put it this way. He said that, you know, wars have started over lesser reasons than what is happening right now in the South China Sea. And then, of course, what will the United States do? It has an aircraft carrier, at least one aircraft carrier, off the coast of the Philippines right now. Will it now decide to sail its aircraft into waters that this tribunal has said clearly belong to the Philippines, which in the past, of course, have been claimed by China? And, of course, what will the response now be of the Philippines president? So far, the language from Manila has been very sober, very moderate. If that continues, then possibly... China may go ahead with what it says it wants, bilateral talks. But in the meantime, I think the build-up will go on. The decision is very much welcomed by Filipino fishermen here. The province of Zambales is made up mostly of coastal communities that are largely dependent on fishing for their livelihood. And majority of those earnings used to come from the Scarborough Shoal until China took control of that disputed part of the South China Sea in 2012. They say they welcome the news, but they have a lot of questions. They'd like to know exactly how is President Duterte's government going to assist them now that they are free to go back there out at the Scarborough Shoal to fish. They were asking also if the Philippine Coast Guard is going to accompany them. They say that they are no match against the bigger and far more sophisticated vessels of China. There are fishing and military vessels out there in the sea, and they said that they have been harassed before. They are far removed from the spectacle of what is going on in the international field. This is a landmark case, but the question here on the ground is, how is this exactly going to change? Because for them, the Scarborough Shoal really is a matter of survival. It is a matter of bringing and be able to put food on the table for hundreds and hundreds of families here in the province of Zambales. So what's at stake then? Well, this map shows all the countries laying claim to all parts of the South China Sea. The Chinese government claims 90% of the area, what's known as the Nine Dash Line. That's equivalent to the size of Mexico. There are more than 250 disputed islands and reefs with the potential for conflict. 
More than $5 trillion worth of global trade sails through this vital shipping route every year. Well, it's also home to rich fishing grounds as well as oil and gas fields. This landmark case specifically concerns the Scarborough Shoal, a reef 225 kilometers from the Philippine coast, which Chinese forces took control of three years ago. Time to bring the guests into the show. We have joining us from Beijing, Einar Tangen, lawyer and political affairs analyst. In Oxford, Ashley Townsend, research fellow at the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney. And in Manila, via Skype, Richard Haidarian, author of Asia's New Battlefield, US, China, and the Struggle for the Western Pacific. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Ashley, distilling all of this down, what does it ultimately say that the South China Sea is simply international waters, fair use for all, and China's nine, uh, nine dash line not legal? Well, that's exactly right. The, uh, the tribunal is a monumental setback in many ways for Beijing, and I think it's uh, far more extensive in terms of its criticism of China's position than many had expected. Um, China has, over the last couple of years, backed itself into a corner in claiming historic rights to the Nine Dash Line, and that has been quashed this morning. So in that sense, it's a huge victory for the Philippines. It's a big setback for Beijing. And it does mean, as you say, that the South China Sea, in, in large part, uh, is not subject to any claims based on legally defined islands in the South China Sea, which means th that all countries are free to operate there, all countries are free to operate their warships there. Uh, but the Philippines is the country that comes away with the, its EEZ intact uh, in the eastern part of the South China Sea. Well, let's bring in the view from Beijing. Aina, how much of a setback is this being seen in Beijing to China's approach to the South China Sea and its claims? Well, I don't think there are any surprises. I would uh, disagree with Ashley on a lot of the things he said. I mean, you have to look this, at this in historical con context. I mean, what we've seen here, the, the boundaries that have been created are leftovers from a colonial past that were uh, forged with blood and iron. They were not the things, you know, remember, none of these places were discovered until a white man stepped on the shore and put a flag in it somewhere, and then thereafter drew arbitrary lines ar around things. This is really something that was uh, developed because of UNCLOS. UNCLOS solved a lot of problems in the West, but it created a lot of problems in the East because of these uh, unknown conditions. Everyone was in a scramble to get it. I don't think there's any question that China has been operating in these waters for a very, very long time. It's a question of whose maps and the legal process, which is very much in question here. This is the first time, when generally when you have an arbitration, it requires two sides to submit to it. In this particular case, one country was able to create an arbitration. I don't know how that's necessarily possible. It also represents a massive power grab by the international court. I mean, this is not something that has ever been done before. They've broken all precedent with this. Now, you might be, uh, Ashley might be cheering this on, but let us be realistic. Based on these rules, any country can unilaterally appeal to this body and start a, a not an arbitration proceeding, but a, what they deem a quasi-legal proceeding in order to gain territory or to settle disputes. I want to take it back to Ashley before we go to, to Richard. Uh, was there an arbitration process going on here or has the court assumed something uh, above its remit? Uh, look, absolutely. I mean, if you are taken to court by the police because you have uh, you have encroached on someone on your next door neighbor's territory and you fail to show up in court, uh, that doesn't mean that the arbitration is one side. It means you haven't complied with your obligations. So I think the misinformation that we have just well, that, heard that is it really comes you're down obviously to, not to a lawyer one... because that that is totally incorrect. Okay. This is not a, a law. Well, look, that this means is international law. You're reflecting law, Beijing's which means perspective. That the majority of international let, let's lawyers Let's give Ashley a, a chance to finish his uh, thought, and then we'll come back to you in a minute, Aina. Go, go ahead, Ashley. No, a majority of international lawyers uh, have argued that uh, UNCLOS, and it is distinct, 
uh, among many international regimes, does actually provide for compulsory arbitration. What it doesn't do is provide for compulsory arbitration in terms of sea, delim sea boundary delimitation. This tribunal is not about, has never been about, and is not today ruling on sea boundary arbitration. Uh, when China signed up to UNCLOS, it signed up willingly knowing uh, that compulsory arbitration was one potential outcome of its participation in this regime. Uh, okay. So to argue now that because it didn't take a part in the process uh, of the arbitration, uh, somehow invalidates it, somehow validates its position that it won't respect the outcome, uh, is quite simply not playing by the rules that it signed okay, up to. Okay, Ayn, I'll give you 30 seconds to come back on that point that you knew. Beijing knew very well when it signed up to UNCLOS that there could be obligatory arbitration. Well, uh, that's, that's not true. There's nothing obligatory about it. Remember that uh, this is international law. That means it's a series of conventions. Look at the United States. It was brought before the International Criminal Court on many occasions, and it simply ignored it. This is what is the real politic of what we're talking about. So to say that this is like dragging somebody before a police court is nonsense. It has no legal precedent. If things are going to be done, they must be done in a diplomatic way, in a well, way that but, all but hang parties on, Aina, feel bound If I'm following your by. argument, if other countries have ignored international law or international rulings, so surely that doesn't make it okay, does it? No, it doesn't. But it starts to speak to the actual bodies themselves which are trying to do this. The, these, these 15 members of the court have never before taken this kind of action where they have taken a single uh, claimant and decided that they would enforce an arbitration. If you go okay. back to previous judges, they have sharply rebuked the court for doing this because okay. they see this as a power grab, trying to make themselves relevant. All right, talking about keeping things relevant, let's bring in Richard for the view from Philippines because right. this is being seen as a victory for your country, isn't it? What will the Philippines do with this ruling while we're arguing about whether it was right or wrong? It, it is there now. What do you think Manila's planning to do with it? Well, first of all, let, let me be very clear. I'm not here to represent the view of my government or a specific slanted misrepresentation of UNCLOS. I think Article uh, 287, Annex 7 of UNCLOS is very clear that compulsory arbitration is one option that countries that have signified and ratified the UNCLOS can take. And the Philippines under Article 287, Annex 7 has taken China to the court. And under Article 9, Annex 7, even if China right, has Richard. not parsed but if, if we could move on, and let me point out for viewers, while we're referring to UNCLOS, what the acronym stands for, it's the United Nations Convention on the Law of Convention Open Seas, UNCLOS. just because we're talking a lot of alphabet soup acronyms here. But, but go ahead, Richard, on the point of what do you think in your analysis Manila will do with this now? Well, I think Ashley was right that the result was much more positive than many people expected. Because it seems that the Philippines won at least over 13 out of the 15 items. On majority of the arguments that the Philippines forwarded against China, it got not only jurisdiction exercise on those points, uh, and, but it also got a favorable outcome. So China's historical rights doctrine, China's nine dash line claims that covers 85% of the South China Sea have been effectively nullified by a third party arbitration body. And under article, uh, 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 under article uh, of, of the ON clause, this is binding. It's not correct that this is not binding. China has ratified the ON clause, so it is bound to comply with the result of this okay, arbitration. But, but, I guess my question, yeah. Richard, is how will how will Manila make it binding? China's got uh, bigger muscles, if you excuse the expression, than the Philippines has in the South China Sea. How will Will Manila try to enforce this rule? Right. Okay, clearly enforcement is an issue here, but there are three things that we have to take in consideration. The first thing is that the verdict in many ways provides more legal justification for countries like Japan, United States, Australia, among others, to conduct what they call freedom of navigation operations because they need a legal justification for that. And now the verdict provides it for these countries to essentially enforce international law and take up the cudgels for international law because the Philippines and smaller countries in the South China Sea cannot force China to follow this. The second thing is that now that the Philippines got a positive outcome and China's nine dash line in historical rights have been nullified, other smaller countries like Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia could also contemplate filing similar cases against China. So China is effectively facing the prospect of like a class suit when it comes to its extensive claims across the South China Sea. Okay. And the third issue okay. here is China okay. wants Briefly. to be a regional power. 
And you cannot be a regional power if you're seen as an outlaw and as someone who only picks and chooses when it comes to international law. So okay. when you get an unfavorable outcome, you say you're not bound to it. And when you get an unfavorable you outcome, you point. say you're bound to it. Then I think this is not good for China's All claim right, you made that point. I want to go back to Beijing, give Aina a chance. If we do have an increase in, in what's called the freedom of navigation, operations and movements, uh, so on and so forth, perhaps more increased diplomatic pressure on China, will any of that, do you think, change China's approach or policy in the area? Will China scale back some of its military operations, construction work and so on? Well, I, I think you have to make a few clarifications. First off, the United States is not a signatory to, uh, has not ratified UNCLOS. So I, I don't know what this UNCLOS and the freedom of, of navigation has to do with each other. They're two separate doctrines. In any event, get, getting beyond that, China is the last uh, nation that could afford to interfere with navigation since the majority of resources that it uses are being brought in from outside and their economy is dependent on adding value to those and shipping them off offshore. So it's not clear to me why everyone always brings this up as if China is trying to halt world trade when it's the now arguably the number one trading uh, company and uh, trading country in the world. In terms of its reaction to this, um, I, I really what I fear is that both sides will start pushing buttons and they will maneuver themselves, much like in World War II, I mean World War I, where Britain was trying to contain a, a growing Germany, and this resulted in actually causing wars. So this is what I'm afraid of, a blundering into a bad situation. Blundering into a bad military situation. What about also mushrooming Ashley into a bigger legal situation? Richard touched upon the possibility that maybe other countries are now going to try, or they might be encouraged to try and take cases against China. Do you, are we going to see the region become so happy, if I could put it that way? Look, I think that, of course, as Richard said, there's a, there's a risk uh, if you're China, there's an opportunity if you're the rest of the region, uh, that having this verdict today um, being favorable to Manila, that other countries would see an opportunity uh, to also put their claims to the tribunal. The Philippines, um, uh, excuse me, the uh, Vietnam may do this concerning um, parts of the Spratly Islands as well, including the Paraso Islands, uh, Malaysia and so forth. Uh, I'd just like to touch up on, on one last point uh, that was just made uh, in terms of the, con the legal connection between FONOPS, Freedom of Navigation Operations, that is, and UNCLOS. Uh, that link is, is by, all means, uh, by all means there. Uh, freedom of Navigation Operations are about testing excessive claims under UNCLOS. And it, to that extent, uh, the United States has pursued so far three FONOPs in the South China Sea and may well continue to do so. I share, um, I share my colleague in Beijing's concern that both sides are pressing buttons, so to speak, uh, could lead to an inadvertent um, tit-for-tat escalation. But at the same time, there have been encouraging signs recently between the two sides in terms of managing confrontations at sea and in the air. All right, Richard, I wonder whether... You, I'm, I'm sure you recall the president of the Philippines, at least while he was campaigning, on one occasion said he might be willing to take a boat and go sail up to China to sort this problem out. I mean, what is the yep. possibility at this point of diplomacy, of bilateral talks? Do you think that appetite is gone in Manila since they've now got a ruling from the, the, the court in The Hague that they're emboldened to try and, and, and push this through other means rather than diplomatic talks? Of course, now we have a verdict which is largely seen as favorable to the Philippines or unfavorable to China. But the next question is, what will the Philippine government do with that verdict as a very country that initiated this arbitration? Now, I know that Rodrigo Duterte, the new Filipino president, is known as a former provincial official with a foul mouth. But actually, when it comes to geopolitics and dealing with China, he has shown tremendous amount of sophistication uncharacteristically. Uh, since the campaign period, with the exception of some of his uh, kind of a spa, like when he said he's going to ride jet ski and go to those islands and plant flags, I think those statements were only made to essentially solidify his patriotic credentials because he was coming under attack by certain quarters who were questioning whether he's 
tilting too much towards China because he has consistently over the last five months said that if I become the president, I'm willing to put the issue of sovereignty dispute aside and try to find an accommodation with China. So right. no wonder a while ago when the verdict came out, the foreign secretary of the Philippines did not use the verdict to lash out at China, but he said that in a very sober and subdued manner, we're just going to study about it. In fact, President Duterte made it very clear that he's not going to flaunt and taunt the verdict against China, but what he wants to do is to use okay. the verdict to extract concessions from China once they start high-level bilateral negotiations. Okay, talking about bilateral negotiations then, Aina, the Chinese Foreign Ministry put out a statement uh, after this ruling speaking of contacting states directly to agree on, quote, provisional arrangements. Do, do you read into that that perhaps China also has a strategy to try and sort this out through bilateral talks and bilateral agreements on resource sharing? Well, I, I think that's always been part of the game plan. At least that's what they've been saying all along, is that they favor a bi, uh, bilateral talks. I think uh, others have, uh, many in ASEAN have actually said they would prefer to have an ASEAN because it is a very uneven playing field when it comes to this large neighbor who has potentially uh, a lot to give, especially in terms of investment, versus smaller, poorer neighbors. So, yes, there's got to be some sort of diplomatic arrangement if this is going to work. But I, I would really caution people about believing that China's becoming soft on this issue. They have the home team that they're playing to who are very concerned about what they see as an infringement on sovereignty. Uh, if you go back to UNCLOS and all of these things, they're not supposed to rule on sovereignty. China was maintaining it as a sovereign of these areas, and that's where the interpretation differs. But in the end, it amounts to the same. Unless it's diplomatic, it's not going to work. Okay, I'm glad that you mentioned the sovereignty issue. This segues beautifully into the point I wanted to raise with Ashley now. Let's just remind ourselves and the viewers that this court ruling was about access to resources and control and utilization of resources, not about sovereignty to territory, sovereignty over uh, some of the land structures and islands and so on. Does any of that, though, have any indirect implications for the sovereignty issue, Ashley? Um, well, of course. Uh, there, China is not able to claim sovereign rights over features in the South China Sea that are technically, effectively deemed to be, to be non-features in, in, many, in many respects. Uh, when, I, when I say features, we talk about three different types. We, we have islands, which are entitled to, to be sovereign. We have um, rocks, which are entitled also to be owned and to have a 12-mile territorial sea. And we have low tide elevations, which aren't entitled to any maritime space. The tribunal has said that in the Spratly Islands archipelago, there are no islands. There are only rocks and, and, and reefs. And in that respect, uh, China now can't claim um, any, any island, including Ituaba, uh, which Taiwan is currently controls, as, uh, as a sovereign entity with a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. Now, this might all sound quite technical, but it has really important implications for this discussion on diplomacy, because were the tribunal to have ruled that Ituaba, which lies in this, in, essentially in the centre of the Spratly Islands, um, uh, to have been an island, uh, then there would have been grounds for a lot of grey zone negotiation around overlapping EEZ rights between China, the Philippines, Vietnam and other claimants. That is not an option because the tribunal has ruled right. in such a way as to say that Ituaba is just a rock. Okay, uh, 30 seconds, Aina. How do you think Beijing will react on the sovereignty issue? Well, they still see it as a sovereignty issue. In terms of the island uh, issue, if you get into technicalities, that's why Taiwan was in, uh, inviting everybody to go along and see that they have a well, that they plant uh, you know, wheat and they have chickens in a school and all of this type of thing. Uh, it goes right. to a lot of things. But in the end, let's talk real politic. It's not going to work without people being involved. And that okay. means all the claimants, including China. All right, and this is not just China, it's all of them. 20 seconds left. A final thought from Richard. Go ahead. 
Well, I think uh, this victory for the Philippines is just the first step in a journey of a thousand miles, as the Chinese would put it. The important thing for the Duterte administration is how to use this favorable verdict to actually extract tangible and concrete uh, concessions from China. So most likely I expect the Philippines not to release a strong statement branding China as an outlaw and calling for China to comply, but behind the scenes negotiate and ask for certain concessions in the South China Sea. And not to forget, after all, Duterte wants to revive bilateral infrastructure and investment relations with China. That is the bigger picture that the Duterte administration is looking at. So right, ironically, right. this negative break Sorry. for China could actually pave the way We're, for a new dawn in We bilateral. are out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Let's end on that uh, hope for more negotiations and bilateral workings to sort this out. Let's thank our guests here, Einar Tengen, Ashley Townsend, and Richard Haidarian. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there, at AJ Inside Story. From me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here for now is goodbye.